Welcome to Innovating Music, a podcast from the UCLA Herb Alpert School of Music and the UCLA Center for Music Innovation. I'm your host, Dr. Gigi Johnson. So is it stealth if a company already has more than 300,000 users? Please enjoy this podcast with Omid Ramat, who is the COO of Tully, which is an app that is trying to take the workflow of Joyner Lucas and take it to many other creatives to build a tool set for them. And we'll talk about how that tool set came about, how it's been growing, and how there's really an interesting thought there about how to reconfigure what support systems are really needed for songwriters and artists in the growing streaming future. So enjoy the podcast and think about how Tully might impact your work or if there's a Tully somewhere in the background of your workflow that you could be growing. My background is primarily technology. And I knew one of the founders, Dhruv Joshi, who's the CEO and joined the Lucas's manager. And joined the Lucas is a well-known uh, rap artist. And they both built a career independently. Dhruv is and has been for many years um, sort of a pioneer in social media marketing. And that's kind of the way that he's developed the artist part. He's been able to take advantage of what's been happening on the digital side. And, you know, he and Joyner have worked together to build his career independent of the support that you would expect from a traditional sort of music industry. Background. So how did you meet them? How do you know them? Well, Joyner, uh, sorry, Drew and I had worked together on projects previously where we'd been working on, he'd been in as the digital marketing person and I was building apps and products for companies and it was tied into what they were doing on the social side to promote them. So there's always a there's always a big connection between. I think it's very important that people have a connection between you know where apps are going to go and where products are going to appear. In other words, how they're marketed as well as how they're built. So technology actually intertwines with marketing in the digital world in a way that didn't happen before. So what was your before? So how did you end up in this this walk of life? Well, I think um, what had happened was that um, obviously I knew Drew. Historically, and he'd been there when I was working on different projects and managing different technology companies. Do you have a, a computer science degree? Um, yeah, have you my been background hacking was in since engineering. you were like five? Well, my engineering, my, my back background was in engineering. I started in the very early days of the PC industry in England when we had computer aided design systems called AutoCAD, and I worked on predominantly graphic subsystems. Okay. And I ended up in the US actually because. I came here to run a subsidiary of the company that I was working for in Europe, and that, that was up in the Bay Area in Silicon Valley. And then I ended up living here. Those companies got sold, and I moved from sort of the computer graphics market into digital media and digital video and then digital audio. So I have a very sort of extensive background in, in the different technologies and building applications and products around media. So but, in, but in a world, I mean, I, t I tend to think of, of old Silicon Graphics and all those companies of having gigantic servers and big equipment and proprietary right, systems. Right. And so, so I came all the way from the PC background. So it was always with the intention of, of making it possible to do. I mean, I, the first products that we actually were, worked on were doing PC based graphics subsystems to mimic what you could do with a Silicon Graphics workstation. So what they were doing for $40,000, we were trying to do for $5,000. So that's where it all came about. Obviously, as time has gone by, everything's moved towards sort of a browser-based situation and to a certain extent with apps, you know. And I don't differentiate between browser-based systems now and apps. I kind of talk about mobile um, in a way that, you know, it's like there's a device and people get to access things from it and that's that, right? Um, so, so the technology has evolved. It's, a, it's kind of gone back to the early days of computing, which is client server. Everybody's a client and they're being served this stuff from somewhere centrally and they're paying for it in increments. So it's kind of been regressive in some ways, but it has allowed people to get access to sort of technologies that wouldn't have been available to them before. You know, you can do a lot now, for instance, in terms of storage. You don't have to store everything on a device. You can store it in the cloud, so to speak, and have 
infinite storage for very low cost. But we used to have online and offline editing. I think back when I was, I'm an old film degree person back in the day and did documentary work and you'd have to, you know, figure out what you're going to do online because you're paying for that time. We are back to that again, that you're paying for the time uh, and not necessarily owning the equipment. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a unique thing that, you know, when we, when I first started, the first 3D systems, I mean, 3D Studio was a very big thing. And 3D Studio was an animation package that essentially did on a PC what a lot of people were paying hundreds of thousands of dollars to do on bigger machines. Now, the reality is that you still need to have sort of incremental increases in performance to do professional level stuff. That you can do a lot of stuff on lower cost equipment now, but up to a certain point. If you really want to get to the highest level of quality, you're going to pay a lot more money for it. That's just a fact of life, you know. If you want to build a TV studio, you're going to have to pay a lot of money to have the equipment, even an audio studio. So there's a lot you can record with handheld devices and PCs and so forth, but at the end of the day, you still need to have some pretty high quality equipment if you want to do what's called professional level recording. But what's really changed, and I think that's the interesting part, is that people aren't as, I wouldn't say not interested in quality, but they don't really care as much. So I remember when the first CDs came out for music, you know, everybody was kind of like, oh my God, this is amazing. I can hear different things on that audio track that you can never hear on vinyl. Like I can hear the edits. I, mean, I had a friend who used an audio file. He said, I can hear the click of the edits. I said, oh, for God's sake. You know, it was, it was an interesting thing. But nowadays, we don't get that kind of quality. You know, people are list, listening things and just walking around and distracted. So it's kind of interesting that we don't consume things in that sort of way. There isn't a sort of stillness to what we do. And so... Um, What's interesting about that is that you kind of say, well, that's an opportunity because that kind of means that, you know, you don't have to worry so much about those incremental performance increases. Nowadays, with music, you really have to start thinking about, you know, how you're going to manage, and I'll call it a product for want of a better word, how you're going to manage your product, you know, where's it going to go, who owns a piece of it, how you're going to track that, you know, where's that data that attaches to your product. You know, there's a lot of optimization that has to go around the actual digital music file, right? Just just to get it out into the world. And a lot of it's a complexity that you're expected to know many, many different systems and be able to patch together all sorts of puzzle pieces where you may not be as technical as you are. Yeah. Well, yeah, that's that's the one thing. And I think the other thing is that the music industry is still mired in in the vernacular and the language of of its founding, right? So I, I I read these books when I first started because, you know, Drew had hired me basically because they'd been building this app, Tully, that he and Joyner had developed because they were having problems capturing all the information and files that they needed when they were collaborating on writing a song. So Joyner would get an email with one file, which was a beat or a stem, and then he would write something and send it off to somebody, and then they'd have to come and come back and when Drew went out, he went out and sort of like hired some people and said, look, I want you to build me an app that does this. I don't want him to go somewhere else to get this. I want him to get it here. And then I want him to be able to share this with somebody, but I don't want him to share it openly. He can put a time limit on how long they can listen to his track, like 24 hours, or they can only hear it through, through a headphone. They can't hear it on the speaker, so nobody can record it, you know. So there was all these things that they would do that they built because managing just the process of writing a song for Joyner involved him having to use four or five different apps and have, you know, seven or eight different touch points with different collaborators just to write the lyrics over a beat, right? So that's how Tully started. And when when we came in, you know, and I came in, it was more from the point of view, like, this is getting bigger than we can handle, you know? I'm staying up all night trying to figure out how the engineers, you know, wherever they are in India are going to figure this out. We need to build a team to do this properly and, you know, we've got, I think at the time it was 70,000 users. It's now 350,000 and, you know, growing every month. And, you know, that was kind of like, this is getting too much now. It's getting too big for us to be able to just do it this way. So when I came into it, I started to read about music. And the first thing that I read about was, you know, how in the old days, you know, music publishers basically used to publish sheets of music and there were different ones. And the differentiation was that some of them had certain types of fonts that they used. Because obviously they had to hand carve those fonts and create them. And that, you know, these sheets of music, predominantly religious music, hymns and so forth, that were being distributed. 
And so, so the different music publishers not only were good at actually laying out these music sheets and printing them, and there was a, there was sort of like a recognition of what the the you could recognize who published it by the quality of the font or the design, right? But then they were distributing it. So there was there was that vernacular of publishing and distribution, and very much we still have it. You know, we still talk about music publishing in a way that kind of doesn't make sense anymore. We don't send sheets of music out, you know. And then you have you have all these other things where you've had for many many years a system where people could distribute music, which is in itself requires logistics and organization. But we don't need that anymore. We can literally stick a file onto a service like TuneCore or something, and it'll be out on all the different services. You're probably going to do the same thing with podcasts now, right? You know, all these music services. Well, you do already with podcasts. Yeah. So there's a service we put this up in, and then it delivers to right. almost everyone on a right. timely basis and gives us terrible data back. But yeah. Yeah. But that's exactly what it is. Yeah. It's all you have to do is you make this file and you put it somewhere, and then you don't really think about how it gets everywhere, but you know that now everybody has access. So... There's no such thing as music distribution anymore. What I always say to people is, I said, there's music access. So Spotify doesn't distribute your product. It just gives access to whoever wants to get access to it. They're not pushing that product. They're not putting it in front of somebody and saying, hey, have a go at this. Here's why, right? It's not getting some shelf space or it's not getting a beautiful picture that, you know, the retailer goes, well, I like these guys. They've spent some marketing money with me. Or, or premium, yeah, for an end cap or something beautiful. Or they haven't seen the radio play, they haven't seen any of this stuff. So there's none of that. It's just essentially, and that's I think the, the number one problem facing all artists is you're essentially only being provided access, which is great because now everybody can have access. There's no limit. On the other hand, that means everybody has access. Right. Right? And, and but, you know, the traditional music industry is built around all these different elements that have gone into taking a piece of that pie because there was so much pie to go around and that there was there was an opportunity for somebody to make money because they'd say, I can throw a million dollars or two million dollars at that artist, right? And I can see a big return on that because I know that I can ship out, I don't know, whatever, 100,000 records or 200,000 records. But you didn't know who bought those 200,000 records. And you also they didn't know necessarily until you got it back. Uh, or, or So then you had all sorts of issues with did people really listen? What are people really doing? But then also you had the workflow to get there as very analog and, and human and face-to-face right. and local. Yes. And to your point, it goes out into the big wide world. and But it's it's instant money. You know what you were selling. You know what was going out. You know that you'd sold it. And it was a big chunk of change. You got $13 or $15 or $20 for whatever you sold. So there was a hierarchy in place, right? Now what we have is that we have the same hierarchies in place, but we don't have the same money. Because every time a record is sold, essentially, which is an interesting thing, right? The whole dynamics of, of Spotify and iTunes and everything else is built around making sure that you don't piss off the labels, the three major labels. That is one way of looking, looking at, at the it. entire enterprise. Right. Which is great. They managed to figure out, and they've come to sort of some sort of, you know, uh, entente where everybody gets a piece of the pie and people said, okay, we're happy now. And every now and then they'll fight over it. But at the end of the day, the only people that really get the piece of the pie are the big guys because they make the big deals, right? And they have the big catalogs and they're the ones that keep the access points full. And have the people auditing the system. Right. And they do. They get all the big data and they can do all that stuff. So it's very difficult for the smaller artist. And so what we thought about it was we said, well, okay, let's let's look at what we can do. We can look at creating um, efficiencies. Efficiencies that take you from creative to endpoint, which means how much help do you need to actually create a song? What do you need to record when you've created that song, right? What are all the elements that go into that song, therefore? And then what do you do next? Well, you distribute it, and then what else do you need after that, right? If you can bring that all together, that's great. But the real trick was to put it all into the palm of the hand, which is mobile, because, you know, most everybody that we know that's our user is a songwriter or a creator, they're not working on laptops. They're not working on desktops. They're working on mobile devices. Or, right. or some combination thereof, that they're right. needing access to it immediately, but they also are needing a bit deeper dive that they could access from a laptop. Maybe. 
some Maybe. creators. Okay. But most of them, if they're, for instance, in the point where the artist is leading something, that artist may not necessarily need to ever touch that computer. They have other people that can work with them to do that. But it's the, the dynamics of it is that, you know, and the music industry is interesting in the sense that you don't need a lot of people to create a song. It could be just one person. Very yeah. rarely is. Very rarely, but, but it could be just one person. Unlike film or television or so on, where you do have to have quite a lot of, you know, you need to have props, you need to have a lot of other things to go into place, right? But you still have a lot of the same overheads, you know? Business-wise, the overheads for, for audio is just the same as streaming video in some ways, right? So, so essentially what we wanted to do was say, look, let's just figure out what would be essential for somebody who started off, right, an artist, how they could be their own entrepreneur. In other words, how much of it can they do themselves? How much of the overhead can they reduce, right? So we started off and we have started off with the notion that, well, okay, well, we can reduce the amount of technology overhead, you know, in terms of what they have to do to write a song and manage that collaboration with a producer, an engineer, you know, with a manager. So here I'm writing this song. I've got this thing. I need these rights. I need this clearance. Well, can I back up a step or two? Mm -hmm. So this was originally built, though, and this is a way that a lot of good products start fixing one person's problem. Right. The manager was the one who was having to juggle all the different people. The artist was obviously saying, look, I want to be able to write my song wherever I am. I mean, I'm going to go out and sit in a restaurant and I'm going to do this or a coffee shop. I'm going to be out on the road, you know. And the manager was the one who was kind of inspired to say, well, you know, let me think I can do this. I can figure this out, right? Because he'd already had experience of being in a technology world and understood that those things were there. And essentially that journey was that they started very simply by saying, I know what we need to make this work for this artist. So let's build this artist something that he will use. And he started off with that. It was purely, you know, Joiner, can you use this? Will it help you? And that was the feedback loop. And how buggy was the first few rounds of it? I'm assuming that bugs and maybe bugs are an opportunity. The benefit of it was that because they had such intimate knowledge of what they wanted and understood it, it wasn't really buggy when it got released because they spent a lot of time hammering it away before it got out. So they had a lot of intimate knowledge of what they were going to do and all the different permutations of how it was going to be used. What was the timeline from ideation to release? I think it was about six months. But bearing in mind that this was being done as they were on the road and they were doing things. and That seems short. Yeah, I, I, and they were... Well, yeah, I mean, the idea may have been there for a bit longer than that, but when the decision was made. And then I think when we launched in I think it was March of 2018, it immediately got about, I think, thirty or 40,000 downloads. In 2018, end of 2018, when I came on board, we'd hired an engineering team, and then, you know, it just went from there. So it's been organic growth. Word of mouth, artist to artist? Um, it's been a combination of, of, of organic growth from word of mouth. It's been a combination of like Joyner's influence, right? He has a big following. And so if you look at a lot of the videos that he does and songs he does, it's always written on Tully or distributed and written on Tully. And so that's, that's been a real big deal for us. Um, they don't really create big spikes, but it's always the awareness is there. Certainly after the first two big promotions that we did, which were all basically letting people know that it exists, then, yeah, it's been very much organic, you know. So, and, you, and then it's moved up to now you're saying 300,000? 350,000. 350,000. Yeah. So how does, what is then the kind of beginning to end? What is the sort of journey points that it goes through? The product itself? Mm -hmm. Or, or the, the creation phase. And so... Someone is sitting in a coffee shop and wants to write a song. Well, what they can do is they can, they can pull in um, a beat or a track, listen to it, and then use a, a lyric pad to write lyrics. The lyric pad has um, a rhyming dictionary. It can automatically, like, you can hold on to a word and give you suggestions. As they're writing, they can actually um, message somebody to collaborate with them on the lyrics. 
call somebody in up to five people to sit, you know, go through and work on lyrics together. And you have a record of that. Yes, it's all recorded. They can chat about that. It's all they can go there. back later and their lawyers can say, look, okay. this person was in the conversation. Well, yeah, I mean, that's, that, that's, that, was, that was not something that we actually thought about. But yes, that would happen as a result of that. It was always with the intention of being artist driven. So the, the tagline is always artists uh, made by artists for artists. And I think part of the part of the thing was that um, we didn't want to make it into something. We wanted to be something that was that was going to be easy for artists to jump into and do exactly what Joyner would do if it wasn't his product. Mm -hmm. Like he'd say, "Yeah, I'm in. I'm in because not because it's my product, but because I'm in." And to be honest, he wouldn't use it if it wasn't useful. So the song is written in the product. Then what happens? Well, you can store your masters on that product. You can store your project. So each song is a project with different beats. You can mix. You can create mixes. You know, so there is a there is a sort of studio element into which you can do that. The drive element, which is where you do your storage, is also a hierarchical hi, hierarchical storage that allows you to share with your collaborators and the various people who need to know what's there. Who have different author authorities yeah. and yeah. permissions to be on. Yeah, and so so there's a lot of that emphasis on that collaboration part and then on the on the studio part it's really talking about not necessarily a, a you know sort of like a audio workstation level but certainly up to a mixtape quality level and the intention really is that you could be able to go to market with everything that you've done so it's a very low overhead there you know and basically most artists sort of nowadays can start off with a sort of mixtape quality product get it into distribution or whatever spotify and all these places and that's a starting point you know it's almost like the old days of bands pressing their own cds and or back to where we have that people making their own cassette tapes. cassette tapes mm -hmm. yeah yeah i don't want to go back that far because no it's back it's back <laughs> yeah and then yeah I, that's true and i think i think that's kind of you know that's kind of where i think it's it's interesting in the sense that what we're saying to them is Look, we just want to get you going. We know mm -hmm. that there's a bunch of other things that have to happen as you go up and you level up in your career, right? But you've got to get started. You've got to have all the tools that you need to get started, and we'll be with you. And then as you go up and you level up and you go higher, then we'll have things that will help you to manage that those relationships and going forward. And I probably should already know this, but how is this then priced? Does it include how much storage you've right got? Right now it's or? free. Right, right now, now it's free. Right now, three hundred and fifty thousand people with a free app. Okay. Yep. Yeah, yeah. We we made a commitment to fund it on the basis of making sure that it worked for as many people. It won't be free forever, but not everything. And I think um, you have to bear in mind that you know the real the real opportunity is is for an artist to get into the big wide world and start to attract attention, right? It's a little difficult to put a lot of burdens on them until they get to that point. So I think you have to kind of be cognizant of that. And we're trying to figure out what's the best way to limit the amount of overhead that they have even financially, right? Because essentially, if we do that, we know that we will attract the right kind of artists. And as long as you attract those artists and they feel like you've provided a creative environment, good things will come. So we are supposedly the stat, which I've heard umpteen times with the no sourcing is there's a million new tracks being uploaded a year, a year, a month. So um, of 350,000 creators on it, how many tracks are coming out of that? Oh, we don't track the tracks. You don't track the we tracks. We track the number of people doing multiple projects okay. and writing multiple songs. So we look at it in terms of what the songs are, right? So how many people have created X number of lyrics? So we have over a million lyrics, for instance. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, and by lyrics, we define that as being over a certain number of characters, right? So it's like a real, you know, lyric sheet, theoretically. And in other words, it's not a thousand monkeys on a typewriter right now. And then on top of that, I mean, I think at this stage, one of the things that we've always been careful to do is that we don't really track our users and put a lot of data burdens on their privacy. Mm -hmm. Because essentially... This is, again, one of the things we feel strongly about is that we're in the business of very subjective analysis at the end of the day, right? And you can't sort of, you can't create a platform for subjectivity. You have to just let it happen. What we have to do is we, we try to get to the point where we encourage people 
to create and write songs and to create songs, to possibly even store their masters with us and store their data and share it and understand how it works. From that, you know, it'll go where it goes, right? We're not predicting who's going to be successful. We're not trying to sort of give them any BS about like Or this. be the pre-market or we will make you famous and have yeah, everyone no. find you. There's other people doing those business plans. I, to be honest, I don't, I mean, it's, it's nigh on impossible. It's nigh on impossible to have anybody say to you that I can make you successful. So you guys are providing a, a fruit tool for people to create songwriting, tracks, putting it all together. Any AI under the hood yet? Whether it's things like, I mean, I tinker with Voicea, which just got bought by WebEx, that's going to be transcribing all of their WebEx calls. Oh, okay. Otter.ai, which actually I adore, that actually I will have running a lot, which will transcribe, uh, do live AI-driven transcription of conversations. Anything of, of letting we someone have, have We have some things that we have uh, mostly to do with expanding or helping the artist expand their reach, like... I mean, I can say this like translations, mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's a big opportunity that I think is left on the side. Um, there's a couple of companies that are aggressively going after that yeah, right now. But yeah. yeah. And I don't think, I don't think to be honest that there aren't people doing bits and pieces of mm -hmm. everything. I think it's very, I think you'll have a hard time finding somebody who's really created the end to end kind of approach. And the other part of this thing, and I think this is, this is what's kind of key is that um, we have, we have a, we have, we have actually beyond joiner, the people who who work with us on the music side, right? We have people who are really doing this independently, and the key thing here is you're an independent artist, you know, and what do you need, right? What do you need to make it that it's all about the creativity, all the other stuff? We know you're going to have to do certain things, you know, and you, you're going to have to figure out how to get noticed. You're going to have to figure out you know, who you're going to work with, how to get them to work with. You're going to have to figure out on a lot of cases, you know, you're going to have legal issues with who wrote what and who gets what and so on, right? We can only do so much in terms of that. The, those, are, those are unique cases, and the more successful you are, the more problems you have, right? But, but in the main, when you get started, right, and as you start to grow, right, if you have um, a structure and if you really build your business from the ground up with processes, right? Then it works, right? So don't wait, it, no matter what you do. I mean, no matter what business you do, no matter what you do, if you're not organized from the beginning, as you grow bigger, it gets worse and worse to try yeah. to go back. So start from the very beginning. You can always loosen up later on if you want, right? But have an idea of what the functions are and what you, what you need to do, right? And say, I've organized myself. Now I can get on with what I really want to do. I don't have to think about this other stuff, right? So... Um, does Tully connect in with whether it's APIs or other things into fitting into other workflow patterns? Yes. We've looked at the opportunities beyond what we can do. And yes, there are things that we, we you know, are very specialized. You know, like I said, pro audio tools are going to be very specialized. They're going to be something else. You'll want to connect into them. There are APIs and plugins to do that. That doesn't necessarily mean that that's... That's not our. You're our, not trying to be the Swiss Army knife of everything. No, 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 no. We're trying to, we're trying to give you, you know, the tools that you need to do certain things. Realizing that there's a lot of other things you will do, but we're also allowing you to organize those things within the context of the sort of framework we've put together. Um, essentially, you could, you should be able to manage yourself, you know. And a lot of artists probably need to, you know. Again, I go back to this notion of. You know, there's not a lot of, in the recorded space, there's not a lot of money to go around, but everybody still wants the same percentages. So my limited knowledge of the music business is nobody has changed their percentage ask. <laughs> That's somewhat true. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and there's a lot of people and it kind of baffles me because you don't have, you have a lot of, you have a lack of transparency, but that transparency is, is becoming inherent because data is becoming available and it's becoming easier to get the data and there's going to be more and more APIs and open systems and they're going to say, look, I can't hold back this. Here, I don't want to give it to you. I don't want to keep bumbling it. Here, go get it from somebody else. They're going to manage all this analysis. And it's, it's typical of all systems. They eventually get to the point where 
they kind of say, you know, we'll give you the data, go do what you want with it, you know, but we're not going to be sitting here trying to figure out how to make it easy for you. So other than the historical miasma of the music industry, what have been the other surprises for you as kind of coming in from outside the industry with outside skills and bringing them to this business? Um, I think it's, um, it's interesting to me to see the big disconnect between what's the younger generation are doing with technology and how much they understand it and how the traditional industry is, I don't know whether it's resistance to it or whether it's ignorant of it or whether it's just doesn't want to acknowledge it. It's difficult because in most industries, right, you've seen that kind of wall break down and that notion. But, you know, as far as the artists are concerned, the younger artists are doing things that just, you know, they can do a lot of stuff on their own. They have a lot of technical skills, um, not just in the sort of rap or hip hop field, but whether it's EDM or music production and so forth. There's a lot of stuff out there, you know, a um, lot of, you know, uh, browser based, SaaS based tools for creating music that you may have in the past needed to have a workstation. I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if we're using browser based tools to do production quality stuff in the future. And, all the calculations have been done in sort of some sort of cloud server, right? And there's stuff out there that kind of does that right now, right? Yep. Um, but those guys are doing the stuff. There's a lot of data. There's a lot of stuff. But everybody exists in their own little island. And that's kind of, you know, it's kind of interesting for me to see. Mm -hmm. Because you would have thought that there would have been a lot more movement to come together. Or different alternatives open up because people were more open to new choices. Yeah, and I think I think the one thing that I my, my personal belief is that everybody's focused on 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 ownership of content. They haven't quite figured out that this means kind of nothing somewhere down the line because there's all this content out there that isn't getting its due course, right? Um, there's a lot of songs. I mean, I've seen a lot of stuff that's really great stuff, and I was like, well, you know, why why has nobody heard of this? Why is this not out there? But there's no outlet for them. You know, so when I was growing up, there was radio, you know, well, there still is radio. Radio's numbers are still. But in terms decent. of, yeah, but in terms of when we look at the younger audience now, you know, we see a lot of the people who come through on our platform. They're not looking at that stuff because I don't think they have any access to it. They don't have any experience of it. So I don't I don't deny that certain things exist and inertia and size will allow them to exist going forward. But. What do you do with this group that's coming forward? And I think what's going to happen is we'll see that the next generation will start to figure out the marketing side. And that's where it's going to be. There's going to be a big inflection point where somebody's going to figure out how to break through, right, on their own without a label, you know. And people have been, but it's still more, I shouldn't say rarer, but it tends to be still connected with some yeah. kind of a label deal. Yeah, yeah. And that that's the bit that I think is is kind of, for me, is like, watch that. What's going to happen in the in the actual breakout space you know we've been looking at that because essentially we want our artists to break out mm -hmm. right but we know we can't break them out they've got to break out themselves that's you know you asked me about the marketing side artists have to learn how to break themselves out so is Tully also then a community we feel so yeah yeah we'd like to think that um, as we go forward, now bear in mind, this is kind of like our first full year operation. As a baby, is as this a, baby. a community? <laughs> but but I think I think the 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 real idea is that you know we feel that the community of independent artists, right, will be kind of like a quasi giant label or, or block in the industry at some point in the future. But I'm seeing it actually in a lot of uh, a lot of. Um, digital tool sets, local communities, that there's a whole new community building out there. So thinking of actually Tully as a collaborative of artists, that can, can they see each other's stuff? If they want to share it, yeah. So they can put themselves into being a sharing model. With, with select people. Select people. I mean, the whole, the whole idea is that nothing gets done in isolation. Right. So you will collaborate, right? So I hope is that eventually we will create, facilitate collaboration on an easier level. It happens a lot more now because... Essentially, people slide into each other's DMs, as they say, and they make those connections, and then it leads to other things and collaboration, and you know, this, this sort of like co-writing and you know, co-performing is a big deal. It's probably one of the 
the main drivers of marketing for a lot of artists, mm -hmm. right? Old and new. I for think. both discovery and helping co-discover other people. Yes, definitely. So, so that's important, right? Uh, that may be that may be forever, or it may be just a trend right now. It may be short term because of the way the situation is, but definitely collaboration is is a key part of what we want to do. But also part of that is, like you said, we want to make sure that we provide a platform where when people do collaborate, they feel comfortable mm -hmm. and they feel like it's kind of the way they would want to collaborate and understand it. There's, there's, there is, you know, there's egos involved, there's personalities involved, there's, you know, demands and so on. And, you know, this is part As of with all good things, things. that there's egos involved yeah. and personalities involved. And, and the music business has, you know, this creative process is very emotional. And, and again, to go back to your point, I don't think you can take that subjectivity and that emotion and try to control it. You just have to sort of try to help it along in a way that's kind of like, okay, we'll, we'll try to let this not explode, right? So if we, have some, <laughs> if we have some ground rules, then, you know, have it out, take it through the ground rules, and then, you know, you come out of it better for it, right? So processes should be part of that. And I think that's the best you can hope for. But there has to be spark. There has to be some drama. There has to be some emotion. Otherwise, you we're can't packaging get... emotion. All yeah, our music all is emotion. Time. So I think I think that's the thing where the easier we make it for people to to focus that emotion on the actual creativity part, and less on how the hell do I make this work. <laughs> yeah. Right. Then that's that's what we've done. We've done the best job that we can do. So I assume then from your vantage point of coming both in from the outside but working extensively in a music product with musicians, you see other technologies. Is there anything else that you're seeing right now that isn't Tully that has you really excited? Anything cool? For the music space? Yeah. Yeah. I think the tools that, that are there for, for uh, music creation and, and, and production, and I mean something like Splice for instance, I mean, I think those things have a lot of potential. I mean, <laughs> to some extent, I mean, it should be possible for almost anybody, right, to make a pretty high quality sound, you know, and they should be able to do it quite cheaply. Now, that does change things, yeah. you know, going forward. You don't necessarily have it. I mean, I don't, I don't want to say you don't necessarily have to have a, a lot of um, musical There's skill. There's different barriers to entry. Yeah. I think it's very similar to what we saw 20 years ago with sort of like um, Photoshop, the Adobe, Macromedia type of models where the professional level tools suddenly became ubiquitous. We used to have terms like prosumer and consumer. And really, honestly, you're not going to take away from the fact that you have to be talented and creative and capable to produce good stuff. But the more these tools become available, the more likely it is that somebody is going to feel confident you know, and may come up with something that they can take out of it. So, or a new combination. Or a new combination. That's right. Right. And I think so those tools, I think, are going are a bigger threat to the established music market than anything that we're doing on our side. We're we're fa we're fixing problems that are in the in the flow, right? We're fixing pipeline problems. Um, there are problems inherently in how stuff is created and the cost of creation, studio time, you know you know, getting music and, you know, right now we're kind of very, very early stages, you know, of, of, of creativity with those tools. And you can tell because the sound is pretty much the same still, <laughs> you know, with, with some, with some variances, but you generally need to walk off the mainstream to see it. Yes. But you know, it's because it's easy. It's easy to get, you know, this stuff for, for, you know, certain price and it's easy to create it. So, you know, I, I hear all the stuff. I mean, again, I'm going from outside the music business. I go, it's great that you sort of talk about, you know, being able to get access to these quality beats and song beds and so forth, right? But you also get to tend to get people who are using the same tools and it's kind of standardized. If we start to see other technologies that are coming out there that allow you to differentiate yourselves, and like you said, people come up with new ways of using it, create new sounds, right? That's interesting. That's going to be possibly, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know where it's going to go, but it's definitely where I think production will go. So, Tully is a baby now. What does the baby's future footprints look like? Um, I think we'd like to think that in the future, if anybody wants to start to write a song, they'll open us first. I say they got me covered. If I start writing my song here, I know that eventually, wherever it goes, 
they're going to be with me and help me get it to where it's going to go to, you know? So we're still, we're the we community still, the yeah. us. Yeah. Yeah. So we're near the end of our conversation already. We've covered a lot of ground. Is there anything you'd like to mention we haven't talked about so far? Um, I think one of the things that I would, I would like to actually learn more about, and which I think, you know, maybe there's a question for you actually, is that the, the music business side is kind of interesting because it influences 99% of the developments and has for so long, right? But it seems to be that it's in a state of flux. And it seems to be in a state of flux without doing much to change that state of flux. I mean, we're in a state of flux as to anything from how, how money's coming in, distribution, international. People are changing songs to fit Spotify's way they measure song listens. So you're monkeying with the first 30 seconds extensively. We're kind of monkeying on the edges, though. People are trying all sorts of new formats, new structures. There's all sorts of new alternatives to things like Spotify that are genre-based or different types of relationship tranches. Part of it, I, I, what I find fascinating with Tully and many other companies right now, is that almost any combination of what-ifs in music, somebody is working on. Many somebodies are working on. And there's various money bets on different directions. But as you said earlier, it's kind of locked into some big players and keeping them happy. Um, so it, it is really interesting. I'm So my work for the Center for Music Innovation has looked a lot in the past year at different ways of organizing, different organizational structures, and what's happening locally, because there's all these really interesting new collaborative styles and business models that are deeply local. Um, and people don't see it if they're looking at the big global arc, mm -hmm. that under the hood, almost anything you can imagine, you could, you know, you might have to find, it, look extensively, put your finger on it, but there's so many different adventures going on. A lot of them challenged in getting you know, rights to be able to play with them, and that's been an issue for a long time. But uh, it, it, it's interesting looking at the money that is now coming to be able to seed fund new solutions to older mm. problems. Do, do you see anything? I mean, one of the things that I think is, is definitely a problem looking for a solution, which maybe nobody wants a solution, is rights management. Oh, I mean, yeah. I mean, if you look at some of these big guys, they have all this content, right? And it's just hidden away. It doesn't seem to be exposed to anybody. There's no way that anybody can go license, sync it, or whatever. It almost seems like, why wouldn't you have... It, it can't be that difficult for you to get all your libraries up and say, you know what, if you want to license this, this is exclusive. You have to ask. If not, we're letting you license this for $10,000 or whatever it is. Just put a price, put it in your shopping cart, and take it out, right? It seems to me like all that is still hidden behind the curtain, and only certain people have access to it. But it seems like it's a treasure trove of stuff that should be wildly available. And I've noticed some companies are out there and are buying up rights for sort of stuff that isn't out in the market, older stuff. And well, and we've stuff. had guests on the program. Um, Museo comes to mind that yeah. was on a bit ago that is going into now having to clean up all these databases to make it so you can find what you actually have. And then um, I'm aware from the backside and other conversations that a lot of the big portfolios of songs are doing a lot of that right now, going you know deeply into the metadata of their own portfolio to say, okay, what do we actually have? So there's a lot of really interesting models on the backside of that to be able to dig through existing portfolios of songs to say, you know, what could we reopen the doors for? We still are at the point where, you know, looking at Buzz Engel's data, that half of streaming music is still deep catalog, that yeah. people are yeah. coming into the... Uh, what do we do with all of the stuff that's our deep libraries? But if you have, but you if you have on top of that a million tracks coming in a month, you begin to have a big swampland out there. And so um, it, it's interesting the new solutions that are all coming out, and that's some of the st stuff we're having fun playing with and talking to people about discovery for it. And not everybody has a, a great artist that's behind their product that helps be the heartbeat of it, who are trying to figure out how to how to meld that technology piece of new solutions with helping creators and those who love them figure out how to make this all work right. and how it works as an independent artist. So it's an interesting time right now. But we could argue that that, that older catalog, the reason why that's still predominant is because it's familiar, whereas new stuff is very difficult to find that familiarity with, you know, for the vast majority of the audience. 
Um, and that's where AI tends to come into some of these conversations to be able to identify the new and the familiar and the just barely familiar. But we've had we've had that kind of AI and machine learning in, in social media, and we've seen that it doesn't actually really work. Or it turns benefit. to sludge really quickly. Yeah, so, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, very interesting. Well, how would people get a hold of you? Um, so people, I'm assuming, can find the app in all of the famous so app places. So Tully app, Tully app is available in the App Store and Google Play Store. Um, I'm happy to be contacted, omid at tullyapp.com. And I will put that in the show notes. There you go. And, you know, um, we're always interested in getting feedback from people. Like I said, app, app fundamental focus is to reduce the overhead so that creativity kind of is easier. And reduce some of the friction between people. Friction between, well, yeah. It's, it all comes down to the usual stuff, right? You want to make communication easier. You want to make collaboration easier. You want to make processes knowable and understandable and easier. And then that's it. I mean, there's nothing here that, you know, nothing here that isn't already there. We're just putting it into a format that makes it understandable and usable for people. Uh, but beyond that, I think, you know, you're right. We have, we're fortunate that it's basically the artist who's saying, this is how it's going to work for me. And I think that's, you know, to your point is, I think it's got to be that way. You know, you need to have these independent artists who come in and say, no, 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 no. Maybe that worked for you guys. It's not going to work for me because they don't have access to the same opportunities as the older artists did either. You know? Well, thanks for coming. My pleasure. Well, that wraps up this podcast. Many thanks to the UCLA Herb Alpert School of Music and the UCLA Center for Music Innovation for being our hosts of this ongoing series. You can subscribe to us in all the usual places, or you can come find us at Innovation dot school of music dot ucla dot edu join us again to follow the other adventures that we will be tracking down in innovating music thanks again <laughs>